Now, today sees Benjamin Netanyahu's first visit to London since last year's Israeli offensive on Gaza. The visit included talks with David Cameron in Downing Street earlier this morning. Though ahead of the Israeli Prime Minister's visit, hundreds of protesters gathered outside Downing Street and over 100,000 people signed a petition demanding he be arrested and tried for war crimes. So what issues were David Cameron and Benjamin Netanyahu discussing? Well, top of the agenda was the historic Iranian nuclear deal. Back in July, the UK was a key player as Tehran signed a historic agreement to curb its nuclear weapons programme. Neighbouring Israel failed to block the deal, with Netanyahu warning that it could trigger a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Then there will be discussions over Israel's occupation of the West Bank, its restrictions towards the Gaza Strip and the need for a return to peace talks with the Palestinians. There's also a threat from the EU that products from Israeli settlements in the occupied territories must be labelled accordingly. And with last year's symbolic vote in Parliament recognising the Palestinian state and the success, if it happens, of Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour leadership election, is the Palestinian cause about to rise up the political agenda. Well, with tricky areas to cover, Mr Cameron ahead of his visit, Mr Netanyahu has warned that Israel is the only true prote protection Europe has in the Middle East against surging extremist Islam. Right, well, we have both of our guests here, James Serene, and we can also talk to Richard Burden. Welcome to the programme. James Serene, first of all, hundreds of protesters, over 100,000 people signing a petition demanding Benjamin Netanyahu's arrest. He's hardly a popular figure, is he? Well, I think what's important is that the meeting today shows that the relationship between Britain and Israel is very, very strong. It's an important strategic partnership. Um, uh, there are shared problems, and, and crucially, from where Benjamin Netanyahu is sitting, he comes here uh, as the Prime Minister of um, the only uh, democracy in the Middle East. He's elected by the Israeli people. And what he comes here representing um, is a very real fear from the Israeli people, which I think is twofold. I mean, firstly, you mentioned the Iran deal. Um, just this week, we've had the Iranian Supreme Leader um, calling for the destruction of Israel. And also, from where he's sitting, you know, just a few hours away by car, uh, we have ISIS in Syria. Um, you know, there are some very, very, very real problems that he's faced with. And in terms of, I mean, what he said, which is very, very important, and that's just come out of the meeting with Prime Minister Cameron, he is prepared to meet with and restart negotiations with the Palestinian Authority without preconditions. And I think that's very significant. Right. Although, of course, the trust between the two sides has to some extent broken down. So we'll see what the Palestinian response is to that. Richard Burden, do you understand the concerns of Israel and of the Prime Minister? First of all, and let's stick to the Iran nuclear deal. Well, I, I think in terms of looking to a long-term peace in the region and indeed beyond, Iran has got to be brought into that equation, and I think the Iran deal will contribute to that. I mean, many of its supporters are not people who are soft on Iran, but they want to break out of the logjam that we've had so far. But why should Israel trust Iran? I mean, why should America or Britain trust Iran necessarily? I and mean, we have just seen Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, the supreme leader, reported to have said of Israel just yesterday, I think it was actually, or certainly it was quoted, uh, you will not see Israel within 25 years, God willing, there will be nothing uh, as Zionist regime, using his words, in the next 25 years. I mean, Israel has every right, right to be afraid. To be afraid, absolutely. Um, however, this isn't a question of trust. I mean, the, what the Iran deal does is put in place a number of steps that will ensure that Iran does not have uh, military uh, nuclear weapons. Interestingly, Israel has already got those weapons, and that's an I wouldn't say nuclear free, free Middle East. Although never actually admitted it uh, formally in that sense. They've not admitted it, but it's an open secret that they have got those weapons. And I think it would be a real step forward to peace in the Middle East and beyond if Israel itself started leading by example then, said it was going to get rid of its nuclear weapons. And actually, if you look at the geopolitical situation now in the Middle East, um, James Serene, Israel's bargaining power is reduced. It's being marginalised. There's a greater threat to be looked at than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and that is the so-called Islamic State. And they do need, as Richard has said, to involve the other parts of that region, like Iran. So to some extent, Benjamin Netanyahu offering the West uh, his supporters, an ally in the region, is not as important as it once was. 
I think there's another view, which is that Israel has an incredibly important role um, for all sort of Western countries, first of all, that want to try and deal with the problems of, you know, in some countries disintegrating this, this terrible threat from um, Islamic extremism. Uh, but on the other side, I think there are some Sunni states in the region that I think you'll find are quietly working much closer together with Israel because they understand the importance of the Israeli role. I mean, you've got to ask yourselves, you know, if Israel was not doing what it was doing and if it was not there, then there would be a very dangerous situation indeed. Um, and I think most countries understand that. I mean, the cooperation between Israel and the UK, for instance, on defence and security and intelligence is incredibly important for everything that the UK is trying to do to tackle extremism and to tackle Islamic State. Uh, I think there is a view that its bargaining power is actually getting stronger. Really? Well, uh, just before actually we come to you, we welcome our viewers in Scotland who've been watching First Minister's Questions. Welcome to Daily Politics. What do you say in response to that? I mean, in the end, it is all about support, um, different tribal, if you like, different tribal allies getting together to try and protect themselves in the Middle East. That is the reality of life in that region. Well, I think what Israel needs to understand, and certainly in terms of the megaphone diplomacy that we've seen too much of from Prime Minister Netanyahu, has got to understand that if it wants to be part of the Middle East, the family of the Middle East, then it needs to learn to be able to live in peace with its neighbours. And that's why... If we're looking at the Gaza conflict last year, mm. I mean, let's remember, 1,500 Palestinian civilians killed, 500 of them children. The United Nations has come out with an inquiry there that's required everybody accused of human rights abuses, both Israel, yes, and indeed the Palestinian militant groups as well, should cooperate in holding those responsible to account and cooperating with the International Criminal Court in their inquiries. I think Benjamin Netanyahu would do Israel a lot of credit if he said clearly he was going to cooperate with that, sadly, the messages that have been coming out of his office have gone in entirely the other direction. Uh, do you accept that Israel lost the moral high ground? Um, I mean, rightly or wrongly, but they lost the moral high ground in that offensive in Gaza. Israel claimed that there were tunnels being built in order to send suicide bombers, um, Hamas, and people from within Gaza Strip were saying it was because of the unfair and cruel blockade and that people were literally be prisoners in their own land. But in the end, public support largely went to the Palestinians over that issue. I'm not sure there was a great deal of public support in Britain um, for Israel in the first place, but I don't accept that Israel was morally at fault. I think Hamas was at fault for uh, firing rockets onto Israel from Gaza and using civilians and civilian areas to launch those rockets from, thereby endangering members of their own population. I don't think you can expect Israel uh, to act more peacefully and to take the initiative when uh, on all sides they're being fired upon and when on all sides they're surrounded by people vowing to destroy Israel, such as Iran. There's a very important point, so I just I can say about Gaza, which I think we really need to look back to sort of what happened in 2005, is that Israel... Uh, was in Gaza and it left Gaza as a concession for peace. So the, uh, Israel was not occupying Gaza anymore. It handed it over to the Palestinian Authority and said, right, you're in charge, let's have peace and coexistence. What happened? Two years later, Hamas took over in a coup and they started firing rockets into Israel. No rockets, there wouldn't have been a blockade. We can't, we've got to be careful about inverting this. There is only a blockade well, because there were rockets. I mean, actually, actually, the historical narrative doesn't actually bear that out. Well, which fact, bit, if, which if, bit if doesn't you, it bear out? Look, well, the facts don't Well, if you look in the last week, for example, 53, 54, I think it is, Palestinians injured by Israeli forces. Within the last week, you've seen Palestinian homes being demolished by Israel. So the idea that if um, Israel, uh, you know, that if Hamas wasn't there, Israel would end the occupation, respect Palestinians. Well, they ended the well, occupation simply, of Gaza. That's, simply that's the point. doesn't well, hang on. add up. You, you said the facts don't add up, but, yeah. but which bit of um, James's uh, recounting of what happened doesn't add up? Rocket, rockets are, were being fired, weren't yeah, they? Um, and Hamas does want the destruction of Israel. Th right. that, that is true, isn't yeah. it? That, that, that's, that's absolutely true. Right. So where how, would, I would, you deal, I, how would you deal yeah. with Hamas in that situation? Well, where I would disagree with, the, with what both Toby and James have said is I don't think it's as sequential as that. You can't say that it all started with Hamas firing rockets and then Israel responded. It's much, much more complicated than that. But ultimately, we need to have a peace deal. What that means is a parity 
of the rights on both sides. Absolutely, that involves mm -hmm. Israel's right to live in peace and security. But it also means the Palestinians should have no fewer rights on that. That means the people of Gaza should be able to live, to be able to trade, to be, have the blockade lifted. And it also means the Palestinians' government should be recognised. It means that Palestine should be recognised as a state, not as a matter of privilege, but as a matter of right, in the way that Israel claims that right for itself. Right, and we'll have to see if Benjamin Netanyahu does actually go forward with uh, resuming negotiations in terms of a two-state solution. But let's just bring things closer to home and look at Jeremy Corbyn. If he wins, for example, what do you think of the statements that he has made that have been widely reported, uh, calling Hezbollah and Hamas friends? Well, I think this is coming from somebody who supports uh, Yvette Cooper for the leadership. But if Jeremy wins, I think what you will see is hopefully a greater focus on his rounded out view on the Middle East rather than snippets of things he said. Now, I think he's come out with some statements that are ill-advised. I think the, a number of them have been taken out of context. Have my, they been my, taken out of context? I, I, mean, I think they've been taken out of context because I've had quite a lot to do with Jeremy Corbyn mm. in relation to the Middle East. Now, I know... I've been in meetings with him mm. where he's spoken to some people who would be regarded as extremists. Now, I can tell you absolutely clearly that he is very clear with them in his opposition to violence. He's very clear with them in his opposition to things like suicide bombings. But he's also very clear that he wants to engage with them. Now, people can either agree or disagree with that approach. But I think this kind of caricature of Jeremy Corbyn's view that's been out there on the media think, doesn't do reflect you, reality. Do you think it's a caricature? I mean, I'll, I'll give you the last one a bit, James yeah. Serena. I mean, how, how would the Jewish community in Israel be responding to a Jeremy Corbyn uh, leadership? Well, I mean, I don't speak for the Jewish community, but I mean, in terms of Israel, I mean, I think, you know, what they'd be deeply concerned with is someone who doesn't understand the seriousness of what Hamas and Hezbollah are about. And I think to close the circle, what we talked about with the Iran deal, oh. Hezbollah at the moment, given the... Uh, fighting that it's undertaking now in Syria is becoming probably the most capable fighting force in the Middle East. It is supplied by Iran. It, it, it has said that it wants to attack Israel at every opportunity. They are a very, very dangerous and destabilizing element in the Middle East. And the fact that we've got someone who could potentially be the Labour leader sort of cozying up to them, I, th I think is of deep concern to everyone in Israel. We're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you both very much.